I'm back with another video that's happening by accident. Um, but I came across a lawsuit, a defamation suit being filed against Elon Musk. And he's being sued by a 22 year old by the name of Ben Brody. And at first, I was just going to run over to Twitter or X or whatever and make a post about it. But after I started reading the case filing and check the case out a bit more, I actually think it's really interesting for two reasons. We're going to see a bunch of name drops. We're going to see Taylor Lorenz mentioned. We're going to see Don Lucre mentioned. We're going to see Nancy Pelosi. The attorneys filing this petition, there's no holds barred. They really seem to be firing the cannons at Elon. This filing is actually going to take us through a thorough timeline of the different defamation suits or disinformation, misinformation Elon has allegedly been involved with. That's why I think this might be interesting to you. More importantly, I don't think this is just a random filing being made against somebody that has a lot of money. The attorneys that took the case, they might look familiar to you. You have Mark Bankston, who is pretty famous now for what they called his Perry Mason moment during his cross-examination of Alex Jones. Remember, this case resulted in a whopping $49 million verdict against Alex Jones and Infowars. The attorneys on that case, Mark Bankston, Kyle Farr, Wesley Ball, Bill Ogden, were all named together as Trial Lawyer of the Year for 2023. And you'll see that three of those parties, Ogden, Farr, and Bankston, are currently the attorneys on this case. So if that doesn't pique your interest, let's start reading this lawsuit. Let's read the first line because it punches. And I would like to point out that this was not obtained from the court. This was submitted by someone who had access to this before it was filed. So we have the plaintiff as Benjamin Brody versus Elon Musk as the defendant. It is being filed in Travis County, Texas, which is where Elon Musk is domiciled. And then we can move on to the petition. Plaintiff Benjamin Brody files this original petition against defendant Elon Musk and alleges the following. Ben Brody, a 22-year-old recent college graduate, has been forced to bring this lawsuit due to the astonishingly reckless conduct of the wealthiest man on the planet. In yet another example of Elon Musk's serial pattern of slander, he falsely told the world that Ben Brody participated in a violent street brawl on behalf of a neo-Nazi extremist group. Musk also stated that... Ben Brody's alleged participation in the extremist brawl meant the incident was probably a, quote, false flag operation to deceive the American public. Musk made these ridiculously false and damaging accusations based on a tweet he had seen from an anonymous far-right extremist Twitter account. After amplifying the claim for two days, Musk personally leveled these accusations against Ben Brody, and it has led to severe personal harassment and permanent damage to his reputation. And here they state the party, so Plaintiff Benjamin Brody is an individual residing in Los Angeles County, California. Defendant Elon Musk is an individual residing in Travis County, Texas. And here they explain the jurisdiction and venue choice. The damages sought in this case exceed the minimum jurisdictional limits of Travis County District Courts. Venue is proper in Travis County, Texas because the suit for damages for defamation may be brought in the county in which the plaintiff resides at the time of the accrual of the cause of action or in the county in which a defendant resided at the time of filing, or the domicile of any corporate defendant at the election of the plaintiff. Now here's where we're going to get some great information, because if you have any interest in learning more about Elon Musk or getting better context as, you know, where he might have his hand in the cookie jar or not, however you want to look at it, this case really lays out a timeline of, of different cases he's been involved in, cases that were filed against him, cases that he settled, as well as different affiliations that he seems to have with what they're going to allege to be far right conspiratorial groups. Now, again, remember, we are reading this from the perspective of the attorneys filing the case on behalf of their client that they're representing. So the context that they're giving here is their background to help them make their case are going to be things that presumably make it look likely that Elon was engaging in defamation per se against their client. Background. Elon Musk's pattern of reckless false statements, promotion of disinformation, and denial of neo-Nazi violence. There was once a time when Elon Musk was a relatively reclusive billionaire, hesitant to embrace the spotlight and seemingly content to dream up new speculative ventures. However, over the past several years, Musk has settled into a consistent pattern of making reckless false statements to the detriment of innocent third parties while fostering disinformation and denying neo-Nazi violence. Musk's actions appear to be fueled by his ever-growing addiction to posting on Twitter, the social media platform he bought in 2022. Yet Musk's pattern of making false statements on Twitter has been apparent for quite some time. 
And here we're going to start looking at piece by piece what these attorneys want to bring in as context. Musk's SEC Settlement for False Statements In 2018, the SEC brought charges against Musk for intentionally misleading investors with tweets stating that he was considering taking Tesla private at $420 a share, sounds like a very Elon number, and had secured funding. The tweets had no basis in fact, and the ensuing market chaos hurt investors. Musk and Tesla both agreed to pay $20 million each to financial regulators, and Musk agreed to step down as the company's chairman under the settlement. When later taunted by a Twitter user about the fine, Musk tweeted, Worth it. <laughs> the SEC settlement now requires that Musk's tweets about Tesla finances must be pre-approved by a securities lawyer employed by the company. Musk's Cave Diver Defamation Suit Also in 2018, Musk faced a defamation lawsuit filed on behalf of Vernon Unsworth, a British cave diver living in Thailand who had criticized Musk's proposal for an improvised submarine to rescue a youth soccer team stuck in Tom Lung Cave. In response, Musk had mocked Unsworth and called him pedo guy, in quotes. When defending the lawsuit, Musk assured the court that he did not mean the term literally. Instead, Musk testified that, quote, by referring to Mr. Unsworth as, quote, pedo guy, end quote, I did not intend to convey any facts or imply that Unsworth had engaged in acts of pedophilia, end double quote. Musk claimed, quote, pedo guy was merely a, quote, common insult used in South Africa when I was growing up, end quote, and not meant as a true or false statement. Yet Musk's testimony was not honest. In a separate tweet, Musk had responded to criticism of his allegation against Unsworth by stating, bet yeah, sign dollar, it's true. And then they include a screenshot of the tweet for proof. Okay, this part's kind of spicy. Fortunately for Musk, Unsworth was represented at trial by Lynn Wood, who is now chiefly known for his predilection for incoherent QAnon mythology, including his delusional rants about adrenochrome and deep state, quote, psyops. Ironically, many of Wood's claims are exactly the kind of absurd conspiracy fodder Musk has been increasingly fond of promoting. Musk's growing affinity for reckless fabulism has become obvious during the early stages of the COVID pandemic but it has markedly intensified over the past year in a string of bizarre and unsettling incidents. Musk's promotion of misinformation about the attack on Paul Pelosi. In October 2022, Musk cited a widely discredited conspiracy garbage website that alleged the brutal attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband was not carried out by an unhinged political blogger, but instead claimed the attacker was Mr. Pelosi's lover in a drunken dispute. When video of the incident later emerged in January 2023, Musk stated that he had apologized to the Pelosi family, but Musk did not dispel the lie. In fact, he entertained it. In a tweet on January 28, 2023, Juanita Broderick stated, Idiots on the left want Elon Musk to apologize to the Pelosi's. For what? It is still a questionable and bizarre situation between two men in their underwear, end quote. Musk responded to the tweet, stating, quote, Nonetheless, I apologize. Frustrated with Musk's response, former Trump advisor A.J. Delgado replied, they were not in their underwear. We know this because we have the video. Why are you still doubling down? End quote. Hundreds of other users expressed similar disgust at Musk's actions. One Twitter user told Musk, you're disgusting. You're still promoting disinformation while pretending to apologize for it. Another user stated, that was about as convincing an apology as one from my 10-year-old daughter to her younger sister. Another stated, what a pathetic apology for spreading lies. However, hundreds of Musk's fans expressed the opposite opinion, claiming that Musk was correct about the attack. And to me, it seems like this part is really what's important, not the three showing that people don't believe it or buy it or take it at face value, but that many do believe what Musk is saying and take it at face value, fans or not. Musk's Reckless Accusations of Child S.A. One impression Musk has often encouraged is that individuals with whom he disagrees have facilitated child SA. For example, in December 2022, he made these accusations against three members of Twitter's Safety Council, who resigned in protest of Musk's actions, labeling their alleged facilitation of child SA as, quote, a crime. Musk also elevated a comment noting that one of the members who resigned is related to John Podesta, a figure of the 2016 Pizzagate pedophile hoax. Quote, small world, end quote, Musk replied, implying it could all be connected. Musk also made similar allegations involving pedophilia against Twitter executive Joel Roth, leading a wave of anti-Semitic and homophobic abuse. Musk's false statements about Heralder Thorleifsen. On March 8, 2023, Musk falsely attacked Heralder Thorleifsen, a Twitter employee with muscular dystrophy who was unsure if he'd been laid off by Musk. In a series of tweets, Musk mocked Thorleifsen, and falsely stated that he, quote, did no actual work, 
claimed as an excuse that he had a disability that prevented him from typing, end quote. Musk later retracted his statements and admitted they were false. Musk's false statements about the May 2023 neo-Nazi mass shooting. On May 6, 2023, a mass shooter killed eight people and wounded seven others at an outlet mall in Allen, Texas. The next day, the New York Times reported that law enforcement sources stated the shooter showed signs of neo-Nazi sympathies and referenced far-right ideologies on a social media profile. On May 8, Eric Toller, a researcher for Bellingcat, revealed in a series of tweets that he had discovered the social media profile referenced by law enforcement by searching various platforms for the shooter's birthday. The profile Toller located had verifiable evidence that the shooter operated the account, and it included photos of the shooter's Nazi tattoos adorning his body, including one image captioned with, quote, Here's what I think about your diversity, you effing losers, end quote. And then they show the picture. He's got a Texas tattoo, too. That's pretty, uh, at least it narrows it down to one state. The shooter's social media profile also included memes reflecting his affinity for white supremacy and far right-wing ideology, such as the following. And then they include a meme with the comment from the shooter. On the social media account, the shooter stated, quote, A lot of the stuff going on in a effing clown world. You better believe they're... Oh my god, this is a mess. Hold on. The shooter stated, quote, A lot of the stuff going on in effing clown world, you better believe there would be we'll convert your children drag queen story hour losers is running around loose. Is that like a word that YouTube will hate me for? I'm not sure I know it, but it sounds like a slur. Communist or liberal fake news media under Hitler's watch. Well, they sound delightful. Elon Musk entered the discussion almost immediately. On May 7th, 2023, a verified Twitter user, Wall Street Sill, quote, tweeted another verified Twitter user known as the Redheaded Libertarian with the handle at TRH Official, who had tweeted a screenshot of a Washington Post article entitled, quote, Gunman in Texas Mall Shooting May Have Had Neo-Nazi Beliefs, end quote. A quote tweet allows a user to reply to a tweet while placing in their own account's timeline for distribution to their followers, as well as sending a notification to the original user. Now, that to me, I think is worth highlighting. He's using the word distribution. They're using the word distribution in how they're writing this. What does that sound like? Sounds to me like they want to already define a quote tweet as something that qualifies as republication to a new audience. And even though this quote is from the Redheaded Libertarians account, it seems like they might be using this opportunity to define quote tweets and how they work and why they should be considered as de facto republication. So, a quote tweet allows a user to reply to a tweet while placing it on their own account's timeline for distribution to their followers, as well as sending a notification to the original user. A direct link to all quote tweets is available at the bottom of every tweet. In the quoted tweet, Twitter user the redheaded libertarian indicated sarcastic disbelief of the Washington Post story. In response, Twitter user Wall Street Silve stated, quote, Now it is easier to discredit the legacy corporate media when they try to push a fake news narrative. Many accounts on Twitter version 2.0 are much larger than the obsolete news media. Without the censorship of Twitter version 1.0, the media doesn't have the same protection. End quote. Musk responded by stating, This platform is hell-bent on being the least untrue source of information. Oh, okay, and then they define... I should have paid attention to the footnotes. So earlier, ZOG stands for Zionist Occupied Government, which reflects the common white supremacist belief that the U.S. government is controlled by Jews. Okay, so it was this, like, acronym, but now we know. I didn't know that. Moving forward. On May 8th, Musk responded to another tweet from the redheaded libertarian who stated, quote, It's a psyop and it's not even good. Musk replied, This gets weirder by the moment. On May 8th, Musk responded to yet another tweet from the redheaded libertarian that questioned whether the shooter, who was of Hispanic descent, could really be a neo-Nazi, and whether his account on a Russian social media website was legitimate. The tweet also asserted that Eric Toller was, quote, a CIA operative. Musk replied, very strange. On May 9th, Musk responded to yet another tweet by the redheaded libertarian, this time containing a cartoon meme claiming that the Texas shooting was a, quote, psyop. In response, Musk stated, Didn't this story come from Bellingcat, which literally specializes in psychological operations? I don't want to hurt their feelings, but this is either the weirdest story ever or a very bad psyop. End quote. On May 9th, the same day Musk tweeted his doubt about Eric Toller's discovery of the shooter's white supremacist and neo-Nazi affinities, Texas law, enforcement re Texas law enforcement reaffirmed that the shooter had neo-Nazi beliefs, as confirmed by his social media account, patches on his clothing, and tattoos on his body. Mm, yeah. Despite all the contrary evidence, 
Musk doubled down on his denial about the shooter's beliefs in a CNBC interview a week later. Musk stated, I'm saying that I thought ascribing it to white supremacy was bullshit, and that the information for that came from an obscure Russian website and was somehow magically found by Bellingcat, which is a company that does psyops. There's no proof that he is a white supremacist. We should not be ascribing things to white supremacy if they're, if it's false. Musk was demonstrably, recklessly wrong. Okay, and my favorite part about the next thing is that they just give it, like, two sentences. Musk's false statements about Taylor Lorenz. On May 18th, 2023, as part of a long-running feud with Washington Post culture reporter Taylor Lorenz, Musk falsely asserted that Lorenz's uncle owns the Internet Archive Wayback Machine and deleted unfavorable information from the archive on her behalf. This allegation was based on yet another tweet containing disinformation. And I actually feel like this is why this paragraph is really tiny and weak and doesn't contain a direct quote. So when you open it, this is the preceding tweet from Paul D. Thacker. The month prior, Taylor Lorenz got this tiny account banned. Surprise! The account detailed Lorenz as a Manhattan rich girl who attended Swiss boarding school and whose uncle owns the Internet Archive, thus erasing her past. Elon's reply was actually a question, and I think this is why they don't quote it. He says, her uncle owns the Wayback Machine and you're saying he deleted information for nepotism? Question mark. That's a big deal. So I thought it was weird that this paragraph was extremely short. Maybe that's why, because it's kind of weak. And I think it's bold to say that he falsely asserted when it does appear to be a question. And we know he has no problem asserting things otherwise. But moving on, that was just a mention of your girl Taylor Lorenz. Musk the alarming favoritism to conspiracy peddler Dominic McGee. Now, just to show you, you might be familiar with this account. His name is Don Luker. He's approaching three quarters of a million in followers. He often has viral posts and he often talks about news happenings. So this is who we're talking about next. Musk's alarming favoritism to conspiracy peddler Dominic McGee. On July 22nd, 2023, Dominic McGee, a conspiracy fantasy peddler who is known as Don Luker, to his half million followers on Twitter. Wow, he got like 200 something thousand more followers since this was written. Posted a series of tweets about Peter Scully, an Australian man convicted of essaying children. In the tweets, McGee posted images from a horrific video found on the dark web depicting Scully's abuse. McGee told his followers that the child depicted in one of the images was a, quote, one-year-old named Daisy, end quote. McGee, who was previously praised by Musk for an absurdly inaccurate thread on the history of racial politics in America, is well known for his sensationalized tweets about child essay, presented in an alarmingly tawdry and distasteful manner with no respect for the victims. Yet now McGee had openly posted actual images of child essay as outrage engagement beat, and you can see that the original tweet was deleted. Four days later, McGee's account was suspended with no announcement, causing significant anger amongst numerous right-wing influencers. In response to the controversy, Musk tweeted, I'm told this account was suspended for posting child exploitation pictures associated with the criminal conviction of an Australian man in the Philippines, end quote. However, in a bizarre twist, Musk reversed the suspension. Musk stated, quote, We will delete those posts and reinstate the account. Officially, Twitter has a zero-tolerance policy towards material that features child sexual exploitation which it calls one of the most serious violations of the Twitter rules. But McGee's conspiracy-obsessed account was reactivated after intervention by Musk. Notably, McGee was among the first exclusive batch of users handpicked by Twitter to receive payment via its creator monetization program. Musk's troubling history with online extremism. In addition to fostering and monetizing conspiracy nonsense, Musk's denial of a neo-Nazi violence is particularly troubling given Twitter's complicated history with white supremacist extremism on the platform and Musk's proximity to a series of controversies on this subject, often accompanied by Musk's frequent interactions with well-known bigots. In one recent example, on August 8, 2023, multiple news outlets wrote about revelations that Richard Hanania the director of right-wing think tank, Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology, had a secret career as, quote, Richard Host, an identity he used to publish disgusting bigoted trash for white supremacist websites. And it links to a Salon article that is 404 Okay, well, I wanted to know. Anyway, let's move on. Later that evening at 3.10 a.m., Elon Musk decided to start following Hanania, and the two have frequently interacted. The media coverage discussed how Hanania wrote tracts asserting that Black people are intellectually inferior, stating, quote, telling a race with an IQ of 85 that they can do whatever they set their mind to is cruel, 
The biggest enemies of the black man are not Klansmen or multinational corporations, but the liberals who have prevented an honest appraisal of his abilities and filled his head with myths about equality. End quote. And this article's also 404 ed Okay, hold on, because these articles do exist. So, it appears the Salon article was not taken down, but either the PDF uploader or whoever helped prepare the footnotes for this document created a line break, and they should probably fix that. And the HuffPost article is still there, too, so that also appears to be an error on the part of whoever prepared that PDF. Okay, and so we have a quote from Hanania. Recently, it's been revealed that over a decade ago, I held many beliefs that, comma, as my current writing makes clear, I now find repulsive. End quote. Okay, so here's where we get to evidence of the pseudonym. So in 2012, Discus suffered a data breach, with hackers stealing the details of more than 17.5 million users. Host was one of those users. HuffPost has reviewed data showing that Host's account used a unique password on Discus that was also used to log into other Discus accounts that commented on alternativerate.com. This indicates Host was using so-called sock puppet accounts, hiding behind yet more fake names to comment on the site. The comments from these accounts are written in a style similar to Host's, and they are linked to email addresses belonging to Richard and Anya. Okay, so Anania obsessed over miscegenation, advocated for forced sterilization, and wrote repulsive rants about racial eugenics. His writings appeared in the neo-Nazi publication Countercurrents, the white supremacist blog V. Dare, and the explicitly anti-Semitic website The Occidental Observer. And that was in the HuffPost article we just looked at. Another recent example occurred on August 30th, 2023, when Twitter's CEO Linda Yaccarino tweeted a response to Jonathan Greenblatt of the Anti-Defamation League, thanking him for a productive discussion about addressing hate on the platform. Almost immediately, hordes of far-right extremist users descended on Greenblatt's tweet, voicing their disapproval of the discussion with disgusting anti-Semitic abuse and bigoted memes. Greenblatt ultimately deleted his tweet. Over the following hours, various far-right and neo-Nazi extremists promoted the hashtag ban the ADL, which soon began trending on the platform. One of the primary individuals promoting the hashtag was Keith Woods, an anti-Semitic YouTuber who is an associate of neo-Nazi leader Richard Spencer and, and Groyper leader Nick Fuentes. Woods, an Irish nationalist and self-described raging anti-Semite, was previously banned from Twitter but reinstated after Musk bought the company. Musk liked and responded to Woods' tweet pushing the hashtag, telling the notorious bigot in apparently friendly banter that, quote, ADL has tried very hard to strangle x slash Twitter, end quote. After Musk liked and replied to Woods' tweet, Woods bragged that, quote, Elon Musk likes my call to hashtag ban the ADL, end quote. These are far from the only instances of Musk engaging in friendly conversation with notable bigots, which has become an alarming pattern over the last few years. Nor was Musk done responding to Woods. On September 3rd, 2023, Woods tweeted a video of notorious con artist Alex Jones bashing the ADL and accusing the organization of, quote, committing crimes against the public, end quote. Woods wrote, Alex Jones doesn't want to hashtag ban the ADL because they're the most pro-Hitler organization I've ever seen, end quote. At 3.34 a.m., Musk enthusiastically responded to Woods' tweet sharing Alex Jones' video, with Musk stating, quote, The ADL, because they are so aggressive in their demands to ban social media accounts for even minor infractions, are ironically the biggest generators of anti-Semitism on this platform, exclamation, end quote. One minute later, a reply to Musk's tweet was posted by Ian Miles Chung, an infamous disinformation troll in Malaysia known for his shocking bigotry, as well as long history of promoting the internet's most asinine hoaxes. Chong is notorious for leaked messages in which he wrote, quote, Hitler is my fucking idol, end quote. Damn, these are some banana ones. I don't know if I can read these on YouTube. Well, and this is from a Medium article. When did this happen? Okay, so this is from September 20th, 2017. Recently, Chiang has reinvented himself as a mildly popular anti-woke influencer and conspiracy theory purveyor, and Musk and Chiang have grown friendly on Twitter over the past year. In Chiang's tweet to Musk on September 4th about the ADL, Chiang wrote, they claim to represent the interests of Jewish people, but they do not, end quote. Two minutes later, Musk responded to Chiang, stating, exactly. Later that day, Musk continued to banter with Keith Woods, boosting another tweet urging Musk to hashtag ban the ADL, and continuing a discussion with Woods in the same thread. Also that same day, Mario Nafal, a controversial cryptocurrency influencer who has befriended Musk on the platform, tweeted that Elon rightly points out the ADL are ironically the biggest generators of anti-Semitism on the platform and repeated Musk's claim that the ADL, quote, causes people to become anti-Semitic, end quote. Musk again responded, exactly. 
During the ADL controversy, Musk also responded with two exclamation points to a tweet from the redheaded libertarian in which she complained about the ADL's recent condemnation of the incendiary and baseless claims of a white genocide or mass killings in South Africa. Musk also later indicated he would be bringing a defamation lawsuit against the ADL to clear our platform's name. The same day as the ADL controversy began on August 30th, 2023, it was reported that Twitter approved distribution of an advertised tweet with a Nazi slogan. The ad, which was distributed to over 200,000 Twitter users, contained an image adorned with the so-called 14 words, a Nazi slogan stating, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Just two weeks earlier, on August 16th, 2023, multiple companies suspended their advertising following revelations that Twitter had been placing ads for high-profile advertisers on neo-Nazi content. Numerous high-profile ads were attached to pro-Hitler account and the account of a leading neo-Nazi group that engages in violence, as well as content from white supremacists and Holocaust deniers. One month later, on September 13th, 2023, the Center for Countering Digital Hate published a report on the failure of Twitter to moderate neo-Nazi hate speech and bigoted harassment. Researchers collected a sample of 300 tweets in clear violation of at least one of Twitter's policies against hateful conduct, which prohibit incitement and harassment of others due to protected characteristics. All 300 tweets were submitted to Twitter's abuse reporting system. One week later, researchers discovered that 86% of the tweets were made on the platform. These findings were consistent with a similar report earlier in the year, which found that Twitter failed to act on 99 of 100 tweets from premium users, which broke Twitter rules and were reported using the abuse system. And these are from a website called Counter Hate. I might open up a discussion for this on Twitter, not just to see the background of this study, but, you know, I'm kind of interested in any data on Twitter bans, suspensions, user integrity. So that might be cool to look at. If that's something that interests you, let's talk about it on Twitter. The resurgence of neo-Nazism, which Musk has been eager to deny on his public statements, has all the while been incubating on his own platform, along with every other form of political extremism, not to mention every flavor of apolitical opportunism and paranoid delusion. This dangerous trend is propelled not only by fear and hate, but also by a social media culture of recklessness and deceit, all based on the monetization of low-effort garbage masquerading as information. In terms of monetization, a report from CCDH on February 9th, 2023, found that Musk's decision to reinstate previously banned accounts would result in enormous revenue for the company indeed. CCDH identified just 10 reinstated accounts renowned for publishing hateful content and dangerous conspiracies that will generate up to $19 million a year in advertising revenue for Twitter. Oh, this sounds juicy. So now we're going to move into some background according to this suit. On Musk's personal recklessness is an intentional choice. What was that quote about fire? Elon loves fire, and sometimes it burns him. Despite once claiming that, quote, Twitter needs to become by far the most accurate source of information about the world, end quote, Musk has been personally using the platform to spread false statements on a consistent basis while propping up and amplifying the most reprehensible elements of conspiracy-addled Twitter. At the same time, the platform has served as a haven for abuse. These examples are the tip of the iceberg. As stated by BBC reporter Cheyenne Sardarizade, quote, these days, if you want to find the latest conspiracy theories trending on Twitter, the easiest thing to do is check the tweets Elon Musk replies to. You'll find most of them. And to pause for my own thoughts there, you know, that's kind of valid, right? But I think it's also important that it's not just that he's replying to some conspiracy theory that's trending. It could start trending because he responds to it. Moving forward. When CNBC reporter David Faber asked Musk about his promotion of disinformation in an interview on May 16th, Musk stated, Quote, I'll say what I want to say, and if the consequences of that is losing money, so be it. End quote. Yeah, so he's not averse to losing money on an impulse. Got it. Musk's reckless attitude, his unpunished pattern of false statements, and his flirtation with the most unreliable and extreme elements of his social media platform made it inevitable that he would falsely attack another innocent private citizen, turning their world upside down. So that was the point of that quote. That's why they wanted to finish and go back to May 16th. This is the story narrative here. All the stuff that we've been presented, they're tying it together before introducing what they want to present as the facts of the case with this punch. I'll say what I want to say, and if the consequences of that are whatever, so be it. That's the recklessness. Musk's reckless attitude, his unpunished pattern of false statements, and his flirtation with the most unreliable, so truthfulness, and extreme elements of the social media platform made it inevitable that he would falsely, it's an element of truth, attack another innocent private citizen, turning their world upside down, damages. 
And then we move into the defamation of Ben Brody. Now, we've gone through 20 pages of background that may or may not be what was interesting to you. You know, the chronology, some more about Elon Musk. The next 40 pages are primarily going to focus on the alleged facts surrounding the defamation of Ben Brody, as well as, you know, the legal arguments that this filing wants to bring forth in front of the court as far as possible remedies, damages, and making the case that they have a case at all to bring forth. I have not read this. I've been reading this as we go. But if you're not interested in this part, the defamation of Ben Brody, I totally understand you're under no obligation to continue listening to me talk about it. I do like to cover little interesting things like this, though. So if you want to subscribe and see something in the future, that'd be great. Stop and say hello in the comments, too, before you go. And if you're into this and you want to hear about the rest of this case and what this team that got a $49 million verdict for the families that sued Alex Jones, and you're just interested in seeing how they, they craft and lay out the case that they're trying to bring forth, you can follow along with me. June 24th, 2023. The Portland Extremist Street Brawl. On June 24, 2023, the city of Portland held its Pride Night event. For the most part, the event was a positive celebration of freedom and community festivities. However, multiple right-wing extremist groups, irritated and triggered by the idea of public solidarity with queer people, decided to attend the event to vent their bigotry and intimidate Pride Night celebrants. Over the past several years, Portland has been plagued by right-wing extremist gangs who attend public events seeking to instigate street fights or intimidate the city's overwhelmingly progressive citizenry. However, on this occasion, two right-wing extremist groups ended up in a street brawl with each other. A video shot during Pride Night shows members from the notorious Western Chauvinist gang, known as the Proud Boys, encountering members of the Rose City Nationalists, a Portland extremist group which openly espouses neo-Nazi views. Some members of the Rose City Nationalists are former Proud Boys whose nakedly neo-Nazi rhetoric was viewed as an optics problem by Proud Boys leadership. As such, relationships between the groups are hostile. The Proud Boys have intentionally tried to soften their public image, with members noting in internal conversations that the neo-Nazi rhetoric used by the 2017 Unite the Right Tiki Torch rioters in Charlottesville was poorly received by many mainstream conservatives and should be viewed as a lesson for reactionary movements hoping to attract mainstream adherents. Rose City Nationalists, on the other hand, seek to continue in the direction originally set by Unite the Right organizer Richard Spencer by adopting neo-Nazi aesthetics. In addition, there were non-political personal animosities between some of the two groups' members. The video shot on June 24th shows that when the two groups encountered each other, the situation quickly escalated. It began with shouts and shoves, and it soon devolved into a street brawl. The brawl spilled from the sidewalk into the roadway, with the two groups engaged in melee, while motorists came and stopped and began honking their horns. The members of the Rose City Nationalists had arrived at Pride Night wearing masks, obviously aware of the potential personal and professional ramifications of being publicly linked with a neo-Nazi hate group. During the street brawl, two members of the Rose City Nationalists had their masks removed by Proud Boy combatants. Near the end of the video shot on June 24th, the faces of the two Rose City Nationalist members are visible. On June 25th, 2023, online right-wing extremists misidentify the unmasked brawlers, and the misidentification is amplified by Elon Musk. So this is where Elon comes into it. Video of the brawl went viral on June 25th, 2023. Throughout the day, the video became a popular topic of discussion on social media. In most segments of moderate and left-wing social media, the reaction was typically one of amusement. However, a different discussion was occurring on right-wing social media. Numerous right-wing influencers were pushing the idea that the Rose City Nationalists, often incorrectly identified as Patriot Front, were not genuine neo-Nazis, but were instead either federal agents or left-wing provocateurs engaged in fraudulent actions to manipulate the public. Many of these influencers also asked their followers to try to identify the unmasked brawlers. On June 25, 2023, at 1.22 p.m., Twitter user Amiri King, a Twitter influencer who is apparently the operator of an online store that sells synthetic cannabis products, tweeted screenshots from the video of the brawl showing two of the participants with their masks removed. King tweeted, quote, two unmasked members of Patriot Front. These are either federal agents masquerading as racists or leftists masquerading as far right. Do you know who these people are? End quote. Here is the tweet here. And you can see Amiri King has 201,000 followers. And the reason I want to note that is, you know, depending on how far this case goes, I'm sure one of the angles of the defense would be to argue against republication to a new audience, which might be a very uphill battle for the amount of followers Elon Musk has. However, it seems to be a pattern that in this argument, these attorneys are kind of painting the picture that Elon is part of this bubble where everyone has these beliefs. So... 
maybe it could be argued incidentally that it's the same or all these audiences overlap since they're all in some deep web right wing conspiracy thing. That's just a food for thought for myself and you guys. But let's move forward. Just over an hour later at 2.31 p.m., anonymous Twitter user Dr. Frenzer quote tweeted Mary King's tweet, and they included a screenshot of social media post from Ben Brody's Jewish college fraternity, Alpha Epsilon Pi. The tweet posted by Dr. Frenzer repeated a line from the fraternity's social media post stating, quote, after graduation, he plans to work for the government, end quote. They actually attached both Dr. Frenzer and the Amiri King tweet that he's tweeting. But let's open it up on Twitter. Yeah, you can tell it's an anonymous account. It has 22,000 followers. And it reads that Ben Brody is a fourth-year political science major from the San Fernando Valley. He has held positions such as brother at large and art chair. Ben enjoys hanging out with friends, going snowboarding, and mountain bike riding. After graduation, he plans to work for the government. So this is, it looks like, Instagram from the fraternity. And this alone had 108,000.2 views. And Amiri King's tweet had 3.3 million views. Dr. Frenzer is an extreme right-wing, quote, shitposting account affiliated with the bizarre Groiper subculture. Like most Groiper social media accounts, Dr. Frenzer typically features extreme right-wing memes, neo-Nazi apologia slash nostalgia, juvenile and cringeworthy attempts at bigoted humor, low-effort beat tweets, delusional panics over lazy hoaxes, and a cavalcade of absurdly false information. The account is the social media equivalent of gutter sludge. 17 minutes after their initial tweet falsely identifying Ben Brody, Dr. Frenzer posted another tweet that also included Ben's social media bio, in addition to the screenshot from his fraternity social media stating that Ben plans to work for the government. That tweet is shown here below. Oh my fucking god, they're so busted. And then they're circling and highlighting the after graduation he plans to work for the government part. What if nothing, working for the government could mean that you're doing like parks and rec, like... I guess pretty vague. That same day at 8.52 p.m., Twitter user Doge Accept showed Elon Musk the second tweet posted by Dr. Frenzer. Replying to Doge Accept, Musk remarked that it was, quote, very odd. That tweet is shown below. And here you can see the reason Doge Accept is showing him the tweet is because Elon tweets in response to some account that's now suspended saying, who were the unmasked individuals? So then Doge Accept shares this tweet from Dr. Frenzer. And then we have the very odd response. In response to Musk's tweet, Twitter users immediately began informing Musk that Ben Brody was innocent. And here are some that they include. So we have one from Andre Danta that says, it's not Ben Brody with the cry emoji that's usually used to also signify someone's laughing. Another, it's not Ben Brody. It's not Benjamin Brody. This is defamation. Odd because that is not Brody. Looks like him, but not him. Some Republicans are saying that, but this kid Ben Brody is legitimately a student at the University of California, Riverside. I don't even think he's a federal employee. It's not Ben Brody. I spoke with him and a friend earlier. He was not there. He's a member of the Oregon Patriot Front, and the other guy is not Ben Brody. Of course, the coward won't come forward, but in due time, his, his identity will be revealed. At 11.14 p.m., about two hours after Musk's tweet, the same images originally posted by Dr. Frenzer were reposted by Matt Wallace, a notoriously unreliable cryptocurrency YouTube influencer who frequently vies for Musk's attention. Ooh, burn, he called him a simp. Now, the point of this is to show that, you know, each of these opportunities where someone's saying, it's not Ben, it's not Ben, this was an opportunity for Elon to learn the truth of the matter and potentially correct himself. I'm sure the defense will make the argument that, you know, this tweet alone, regardless of any other notifications he was getting for anything else that day, had over 10,000 notifications probably stemming from it. So the defense might counter that by saying, how was he supposed to see them? June 26, 2023, Musk continues to amplify the accusation against Ben Brody. The following morning at 5.34 a.m. on June 26, Musk replied to Matt Wallace's tweet. Musk stated, quote, always remove their masks, end quote. That tweet is shown below. By the way, the Matt Wallace tweet that was cited here, it says this page doesn't exist. And it appears to be the full URL. It's not chopped off by the PDF. Then here's the current tweet. It had 2.1 million views. They always remove their masks. And over 50,000 likes. 5,776 5, retweets. Dr. Frenzer was pleased that the false accusation they made had reached Musk. Dr. Frenzer quote tweeted Wallace's tweet after Musk replied, stating, quote, me famous, my memes best memes, end quote. 
Ben Brody woke up on the morning of June 26th and realized the situation was spiraling out of control. At the urging of his friends, he posted a video on his Instagram account trying to clear his name. Okay, wait a minute. So it's interesting that we have all this chronology of what Dr. Frenzer, the Dr. Frenzer account, is tweeting. But Dr. Frenzer's account actually tweeted this video and said, hmm, seems convincing. They didn't try to obscure it or hide it or anything like that. Let's take a look. Yeah, I've just been so busy dressed most accusations against me. Um, I wanted to first uh, say that I am not a part of the patriotic front uh, as a member in that, p- that people who are claiming I am, I am being confused with someone who looks similar to me. And I've never been to Oregon City for any protest whatsoever. Recently, I've just been so busy in terms of graduation from Sea Riverside and stuff like that. I was, you know, I've been in Riverside only. This is just crazy to me. And um, I graduated on June 21st and I've just been hanging out with my friends. And then all these accusations are kind of just crazy and, and incorrect. You know, I would, uh, my family and I are just harassed completely. And I would be more than happy to clear up any confusion if necessary. You know, this is just so ridiculous. And I really just can't believe this is happening to me right now, guys. Um, the rest. Uh, false accusations against me. Um, I wanted to first uh, say that I am not a part of the patriotic front. Ben then posted debit card receipts showing his card was used in Riverside, California on the day of the Portland Street Brawl and even went as far as to contact one of the stores to request their video footage. Later that day, he posted timestamp video footage showing he was in California at the time of the brawl. At 8.52 a.m. on June 26, 2023, Brian Krasenstein, an influencer who has grown close to Musk on Twitter over the past year, posted a tweet sharing Ben Brody's Instagram video. Krasenstein stated, This needs to stop before things get out of hand. Please share before this guy's life is ruined. Throughout the day, Twitter users sent frantic replies to Musk's 5.34 a.m. tweet informing him that Ben Brody was incident. At 6.46 a.m., verified Twitter user PNW Selena replied to Musk by stating, Those aren't the same kid though, Elon. At 7.05 a.m., Twitter user Patriot Alitz replied to Musk by stating, Brody has posted a video stating that it wasn't him. This tweet included a link to Ben Brody's Instagram video. At 7.28, Twitter user Infinite Zonk replied to Musk by stating, Hey, Elon, what are your thoughts on Mr. Brody's Instagram video where he says you're helping incite lunatics to harass him based on a video of someone else? The tweet included a link to Ben Brody's Instagram video. 7.48, Twitter user SFL Loans replied to Musk by stating, Elon Musk, Ben Brody has posted a video claiming he is not the man in the video. He has no bruising on his face, which a suspect in the video would have. Elon, you amplified this likely false claim, and this young man's life is in danger because of it. What are you going to do? And again, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 25 more examples of tweets. So over 25 tweets that they're providing as um, what I'm assuming is what they will argue was a chance for Elon to learn the truth, retract what he said, change his stance, and stop engaging in what they will allege is defamation of Ben Brody. And again, this is all in response to the always remove their masks tweet. We are more than halfway through. Let's keep going. That day, Ben Brody had done everything he could think of to debunk the false accusations, and he went to bed on June 26, hoping that the attention he was receiving might dissipate. This is important because it just shows that he did something reasonable to seek remedy for what was happening. June 27, 2023. After amplifying the claims for days, Elon Musk personally commits defamation against Ben Brody when replying to a Zero Hedge tweet. Early in the morning of June 27, so this is a day after the Always Remove Their Masks tweet, a blog post was published on Zero Hedge titled, quote, Patriot Front White Supremacist Unmasked as Suspected Fed, end quote. Zero Hedge is a notoriously unreliable blog that has trafficked in the ugliest smear campaigns on the internet. Zero Hedge is well known for the prominent role it played in gleefully spreading false facts about the victims and parents of the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Zero Hedge worked in tandem with the reviled con artist Alex Jones to push the idea that the shooting was staged by the government and that the parents were paid actors. Indeed, InfoWars' response to a Zero Hedge blog post was the impetus of the lawsuit brought by Sandy Hook parents Neil Hesselin and Scarlett Lewis, who were also represented by undersigned counsel. 
Zero Hitch's June 27, 2023 blog post about the Portland Street Brawl, posted by, quote, Tyler Durden, quote, which is, you know, they're using the meme and, and likeness of Brad Pitt and Fight Club, featured tweets embedding the video of two participants being unmasked. The blog post also linked to a tweet by Twitter user named Dillian Fillion with the username Dillian Fillion IA. On his Twitter account, Fillion appears to be a young teenage boy with political aspirations. Fillion's tweet stated, quote, breaking. The identities of the two feds have been found, end quote. Fillion attached a screenshot of a social media bio for Ben Brody. The bio identified his username as BrodyBen3 and stated, quote, hello, my name is Ben Brody. I'm a poli-sci major at UCR, end quote. Zero Hedge's blog post did not reference the images posted by Dr. Frenzer, nor did it contain any mention of Ben Brody wanting to work for the government. On June 27, 2023, at an unknown time, Zero Hedge's Twitter account posted a tweet with a link to the Zero Hedge blog post. Musk decided to reply to the Zero Hedge tweet, and he added his own accusation, which was based on false information that he had encountered from unvetted tweets in the days prior from Dr. Frenzer and Matt Wallace. In a tweet posted at 8.22 a.m., Musk stated, Looks like one is a college student who wants to join the government, and another is maybe an Antifa member. But nonetheless, a probable false flag situation. That tweet is shown below. Interesting that at the bottom of this tweet, Elon tagged community notes. In this context, the phrase looks like is equivalent in meaning to the information I have seen indicates. Importantly, the information Musk used to support his assertion was not contained in the Zero Hedge tweet, nor was it contained in the Zero Hedge blog post, nor did Musk disclose a source of information in his June 27th tweet. A reasonable reader of Musk's tweet would conclude that undisclosed information served as the basis for Musk's assertion. Indeed, multiple Twitter users asked Musk to provide the information on which he was basing his assertion. Many readers of Musk's June 27th tweet were already familiar with the rumor about Ben Brody and his plans to work for the government. Many readers of Musk's tweet immediately understood that the tweet was referring to Ben Brody, who they understood was a college student who wants to join the government. So this is going to establishing, you know, the reasonableness, the implication, the the inference. The assertion made by Musk was capable of being verified as true or false, not a matter of opinion. This is going to the elements, establishing the elements, nor would it matter if Musk had couched his remarks as an opinion. As the Supreme Court has explained, if a speaker says, quote, in my opinion, John Jones is a liar, he implies a knowledge of facts, which leads to the conclusion that Jones told an untruth. Even if the speaker states the facts upon which he bases his opinion, if those facts are either incorrect or incomplete, or if his assessment of them is erroneous, the statement may still imply a false assertion of fact. Simply couching such statements in terms of opinion does not dispel these implications, and the statement, in my opinion, Jones is a liar, can cause as much damage to reputation as the statement, Jones is a liar. And then they cite Campbell versus Clark. Given the circumstances, the defamatory idea communicated to readers of Musk's statement is that one of the participants in the neo-Nazi group was Ben Brody. Musk also used this false accusation about Ben Brody, the college student who wants to join the government, to support his assertion that the event was a probable false flag situation. A false flag is a term that was popularized among conspiracy theory media figures to mean a hostile or harmful action, typically an attack or other act of violence, that is designed to look like it is perpetrated by someone other than the person or group responsible for it. A false flag is a type of psyop or psychological operation, a concept which Musk has fixated on for several months, and we see that the undersigned counsel here has brought it up several times earlier in the background context. And then we have this footnote. And this might explain why this suit is Ben Brody against Elon Musk. It's not Ben Brody and the other guy against Elon Musk. And it's not Ben Brody versus Elon Musk and Zero Hedge or Amiri King or the other accounts that we've seen. This footnote here says, Musk's other assertion that the other unmasked neo-Nazi brawler was maybe an Antifa member was qualified with a cautionary maybe, unlike the accusation against Ben Brody. Once again, many Twitter users began replying or quote tweeting to Musk. Many of those users who replied to Musk understood he was referring to Ben Brody and accepted Musk's statement as true, while others tried to inform him of the erroneous and damaging nature of his accusations against Ben. So here we're going to have a series of, let's count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 
48, about 48 different examples. So like 47 examples demonstrating that people tried to call out Musk, inform him of the truth of the matter, tell him what he was doing was damaging, all of those. They do give several footnotes if you want to go and look at them, but you could probably just go to that tweet and read the replies and quote tweets, and I'm sure there's a lot more than are cited here. And here we get to where we're going to talk about the, the alleged damages. So the aftermath. Musk's June 27th, 2023 tweet has been viewed more than 1.2 million times by logged in Twitter users. The tweet has also been viewed by an unknown number of individuals who were not logged into Twitter or individuals who encountered Musk's statements as an embedded tweet, as neither type of view is included in Twitter's public view count. And remember, this is before June 27th, 2023 was before, you know, Twitter wants you to log in to see more. Numerous online influencers and websites also featured screenshots of Musk's tweet in their articles and posts. Musk's personal endorsement of the false accusation against Ben Brody reverberated across the internet, transforming the accusation from anonymous rumor to gospel truth for many individuals and causing others to use Musk's endorsement to justify their desire to harass Ben Brody and his family. So they're extending, by extension, any damages caused by these individuals back to what they're framing as Elon Musk's personal endorsement of the false accusation. Ben had been disturbed by the initial rumor, but he found the courage to post a video to the public on June 26 in hopes of dispelling the accusation. Yet when Musk fully endorsed the accusation on June 27, Ben felt like his life was over. Ben spent the following days and weeks in a cycle of panic, fear, denial, disorientation, and depression. Ben suffered physical manifestations of his emotional distress, including difficulty sleeping, panic attacks, headaches, and fatigue, which disrupted his daily life and severely impacted his sense of well-being. Ben and his family were repeatedly doxxed and suffered an enormous wave of harassment from belligerent strangers. Ben and his family's experience of seeing him defamed by one of the most powerful men on earth warped their entire sense of reality, leaving them stunned, confused, and afraid. Two weeks after Musk's statements, it was apparent to Ben that his reputation had been catastrophically damaged and that a huge number of people believed he was either a neo-Nazi or a provocateur involved in a deceptive psyop to commit political terrorism. Ben felt he needed to try harder to clear his name. On July 11th, 2023, Ben decided to give an interview to Vice News. In the interview, Ben told the reporter about his panic attacks over the idea that my life is over and everything that I tried to work for and all this is just completely gone. Ben described the experience at, I think that means as, terrifying. He also could not stop thinking about the effect this incident could have on his future. Yeah, I mean, if he wants to work for the government and this is believed, it could be a problem. In the wake of the article, Ben realized that despite his efforts to publicize his innocence, it was likely this message would never reach the people who most needed to hear it. So that's going to go back to the metrics and insights and all of those public views that couldn't even be tracked from two of the Elon Musk tweets. They'll always take their mask off. And then the one where he stated that the other guy may be an Antifa member, but implied that Ben Brody was the other guy in the video. An enormous audience followed Musk's statements about the June 24th Portland street brawl, and many of them have adopted an extreme skepticism of commercial media. These audiences are distrustful of any information that does not originate in their specific bubble or involve one of their favored online influencers. You know, I always personally think this is an interesting thing to come from the plaintiff in a defamation case, because one could argue, I don't know how successfully, but one could argue that these are not reasonable people. And if you're only putting forth that all of these unreasonable people are believing this thing from their specific bubble, to me that kind of weakens a defamation argument. However, I think it's probably irrelevant because in the big picture here, these tweets are reaching like millions of people, right? I, this is not really isolated to a bubble, but it's still kind of a weird thing. It seems like this, this attorney is, whoever's writing this, is very keen on is focused on describing this group the way they want to describe them, even though it kind of goes against the reasonableness of the belief of the claim. A really interesting, and I don't disagree that this description probably accurately applies to a subset of the included audience here, right? But I think it would be a stronger case if they didn't say these audiences. And anyway, anyway. Elon Musk, the most followed user on Twitter, is perhaps the most influential of all influencers. Okay, so here we go. 
And his endorsement of the accusation against Ben galvanized other social media influencers and users to continue their attacks and harassment, as well as post accusations against Ben that will remain online forever. So that's important because there's no like remedy to just remove everything and it's gone. You'd have to go through all these different accounts and get rid of it. And they've established earlier in the background context that Twitter currently doesn't seem inclined to remove things, whether there's disinformation in them or not. So this is establishing to the judge that's going to look this over that that's not going to be a remedy. We can't just clean it up. Ben was put through intense terror because of Musk's recklessness. And now Ben finds himself depressed, freaked out, and mentally distraught right at the crucial personal moment when he exits college and enters his career path. Ben is also worried about the effects years down the road and what jobs he might lose to other candidates due to the controversy or misunderstanding. He worries that he may always have to live with that self-doubt. Ben is fearful about the future consequences of forever having this event tied to his name and photograph on the internet. Ben worries that future employers may decide that it's simply not worth it to hire an employee in a public-facing position who is connected to a bizarre controversy involving a neo-Nazi group. Ben fears his applications for top-tier positions may get passed over in favor of applicants with unblemished personal histories. He fears he will always worry whether his life might have taken a more productive path without the reckless interference of Elon Musk. Ben is also aware that fringe members of conspiracy-obsessed communities often fixate years later on individuals who are alleged to have participated in a false flag, such as the parents of children murdered at Sandy Hook, the owner of Comet Ping Pong, the Sutherland Springs pastor, the student activist from Stoneman Douglas High School, the alleged January 6th provocator Ray Epps, and many, many lesser-known alleged crisis actors, all of whom suffer harassment to this day. Ben is worried about a confrontation from a member of those communities in the years to come. I mean, we saw Pizzagate mentioned earlier. We obviously saw Sandy Hook mentioned earlier. And we know that the undersigned counsel are very familiar with those matters. We saw January 6th mentioned earlier, though we didn't see Ray Epps mentioned by name. He is also aware. Um, But I would imagine his counsel helped make him aware of the extent of this. But this is an important argument that they want to make because they're speculating that Ben will be damaged in the future because of, you know, employability, hireability, and things like that. So this paragraph to me seems like the council pointing out other instances where this speculation, past performance could predict future performance, if you will. Moving forward, Ben is also greatly disturbed that he was used by someone as influential as Musk to deny the reality of an event, to deny the reality of an event involving neo-Nazism, which is something Musk has done multiple times in the past few months. Further, given his Jewish heritage, Ben was understandably horrified at being accused by Musk of donning neo-Nazi regalia an act that would be utterly profane and blasphemous if true. In sum, Ben has suffered a severe emotional harm and emotional damage to his reputation and public image. On August 9, 2023, Musk was informed through his attorneys of the circumstances supporting Ben's claim for defamation, as well as Ben's profound distress that Musk had not taken any steps to retract his accusation. In response, Musk has refused to retract his accusation or even delete his tweets. In fact, Musk's attorney indicated that Musk would seek fee shifting if Ben attempts to hold Musk accountable in court. In other words, if this 22-year-old victim tries to seek redress in court for what happened to him, he must risk having the wealthiest man on the planet seek to collect fees against him. Ben is undeterred by Musk's callous response because he understands that a lawsuit is the only way he will be able to truly clear his name. Ben knows that unless he confronts Musk and attempts to hold him accountable for his reckless false accusation, many people will continue to believe the accusation or view him with a cloud of suspicion. And here's where we get macro level. The reality is that too many powerful people with enormous audiences are being reckless with their accusations against private people. The damage they cause is not easily repaired by apologies or counterspeech, no matter how persuasive. Repair of reputations, compensation for harm, and effective deterrence can only occur in our courts. It is these courts to which Ben Brody now turns to uphold a very simple concept. What Elon Musk has been doing to Ben and others is not tolerable. It is necessary that Ben take a stand against Musk's conduct and have his case heard in the justice system, regardless of Musk's power or wealth. It has become clear that Musk will not stop unless someone stops him. It seems that responsibility now falls upon a shy young man whose world has been shaken by Musk's reckless conduct. Causes of action libel, per se or per quad. Ben Brody is a private individual and is neither a public official nor a public figure for any purpose. Musk's June 27, 2023 statements were of and concerning Ben Brody. Due to contemporary events, many readers were acquainted with Ben Brody such that they reasonably understood from reading Musk's June 27, 2023 statements that Musk was referring to Ben Brody. Musk's June 27, 2023 statements were false. 
both in their particular facts and their main point, essence, or gist in the context in which they were made. The gist of Musk's statements on June 27, 2023, quote, looks like one is a college student who wants to join the government, was that Ben Brody was a participant in the June 24th Portland Street brawl on behalf of the Rose City Nationalists. Musk also used this false accusation against Ben Brody to support his assertion that the event was a probable false flag operation. Musk's statements constitute defamation per se, as he made an accusation of unlawful conduct by reasonable implication or insinuation. Musk's accusation was calculated to induce those who heard them to understand that Ben Brody had acted unlawfully. Musk's accusation constitutes defamation per se because it implicates Ben Brody in unlawful acts, including disorderly conduct, criminal mischief, assault, battery, conspiracy to riot, and conspiracy to commit terrorism. Alternatively, to the extent that Musk's June 27, 2023 statements do not constitute libel per se, they are actionable as libel per quad. Musk's June 27, 2023 statements convey a defamatory meaning because of facts and circumstances expressed before or otherwise known to readers concerning Ben Brody and the June 24 Portland Street Brawl. Musk's accusation that Ben Brody was a participant in the June 24 Portland Street Brawl as a member of the neo-Nazi group injured Ben Brody's reputation, exposed him to public hatred, contempt, and ridicule, and it impeached his honesty, integrity, and virtue. Musk's accusation implied that he knew undisclosed information supporting his statements. There is no mention in the Zero Hedge tweet or blog post about the unmasked individual wanting to work for the government. When Musk referenced that fact, a reasonable reader would understand that Musk was basing his allegation on undisclosed information he encountered elsewhere. Musk's statement was not accompanied by the information purportedly justifying the accusation. The undisclosed information purportedly justifying Musk's accusation was false. Musk acted with negligence, failing to act as a reasonably prudent person in Musk's position would act given all the circumstances. Musk further acted with actual malice because Musk's defamatory statements were made with reckless disregard for the truth or falsity of the statements at the time they were made. Alternatively, Musk knew the statements were false. Musk's statements were not privileged. Musk published the defamatory statements to an enormous audience, causing significant harm to Ben Brody. As a unique global celebrity, Musk's accusation was predictably republished by countless individuals across the world. Damages Musk's defamatory statements have and will continue to cause harm to Ben Brody. Due to Musk's conduct, Ben Brody has suffered and continues to suffer substantial damages in an amount to be proven at trial. Ben Brody has suffered and will continue to suffer general and special damages, including a severe degree of mental stress, anguish, fear, personal embarrassment, and psychological harm which disrupted his daily life. Ben Brody has also suffered severe damage to his reputation and image, both up to the present and into the future. Because Musk's conduct amounts to defamation per se, Ben Brody is also entitled to an award of presumed damages, nominal damages, and a judgment clearing his name due to Texas Civil Practices and Remedies Code, Section 73059. Ben Brody is entitled to exemplary damages without a showing of actual malice because Musk failed to make a timely and sufficient correction clarification, or retraction. That's why they highlighted, obviously, the correspondence between the attorneys earlier. Regardless, Ben Brody is also entitled to exemplary damages because Musk acted with malice. Ben Brody is entitled to pre-judgment, post-judgment interest, and costs of court. Rule 47 Notice Pursuant to Rule 47 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, the relief in this lawsuit will exceed $1 million. Jury Demand Ben Brody demands a jury trial and tenders the appropriate fee with this petition. Prayer. Were for premises considered, Plaintiff Ben Brody asks that the court issue citation for the defendant to appear and answer, and that the plaintiff will be awarded all the damages set forth above, and to grant whatever further relief to which the plaintiff is justly entitled, respectfully submitted, Farrer and Ball. And again, you have Mark Bankston, Kyle Farrer, William Ogden. So that's that. Um, I really only saw this NPR article on it. And I'm interested in social media. I'm interested in disinformation. I'm interested in legal case filings. I think this is being brought forth by a very prominent law firm. I thought the history they laid out, times Elon made impulsive decisions and engaged in impulsive actions without caring about the monetary consequences or losing money over it. I think all of that stuff's very interesting. I think this is all very interesting coming on the heels of the Variety article that was published about Amber Heard, Aquaman 2, the allegations against James Wan and Jason Momoa wanting to fire her, how Jason Momoa was abusive on set, and how 
Elon Musk allegedly had one of his litigators send a, quote, scorched earth letter to Warner Brothers, threatening to burn the house down, end quote, if the actress wasn't brought back for a sequel. So very interesting. And again, the filing that is available, what I'm reading from, you know, it, it doesn't have the court markings on it. It's not dated. But the NPR article was published on October 4th, 2023. So I'm assuming it was submitted to the court or was en route to be submitted to the court on or before that day. So if you made it this far, what do you think? And again, I created this video because I was going to make a tweet about it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go on forever and ever. Let me just look into this a little bit more and put it into a video in case someone wants to listen to it or see it for themselves. But you can always start the conversation in the comments. I love to engage. I love to learn more. If you've got more information, I'd love for you to share it. You can also engage with me on Twitter. I will provide a link to the filing in the description. I'll provide a link to the NPR article as well as my own Twitter handle if you want to talk to me on there. I don't plan to become an Elon News channel, and this channel will probably just be things that I find interesting or worth talking about or significant in in the world of legal, criminal, or civil suits, as well as breaking down what I think are questionable takes and questionable information in the entertainment world. So if you stick around, hopefully I'll see you next time. So I hope everyone has a great day, and who knows, maybe you'll see me pop up another video that was too long to be a tweet. Take care.